Greetings, welcome to another episode of Inspired Conversations, Living the Legacy with the Legend on Global Conference TV. Life is all about learning from our failures. Challenges, disappointments, and hurts are part of our everyday lives. Lorama Kufela has an inspiring story to tell, a story to inspire generations, and a story to change lives. And she is joining me today to share more about her story. You might have heard her story on radio, on TV, or on the newspapers. But today she's here live on Global Conference TV. Thank you so much for coming, and you're welcome. Thank you so much for the invite. Let's start from the beginning. Kimang Oslora Makufa. Laura Makafola is a township girl from Gwe Alexander, and I'm a life coach. I'm an NLP practitioner. I also am a lifestyle entrepreneur. Okay. And you said you have a story that can change someone. Only one person, it will be enough. That will be enough. Take us through your story, especially, let's start when you were 16 years old. Something bad happened to you. Well, when I was 16 years old, it happened that I got into a fight, all right? And that fight, it was with a boy. It left me with my left hand side. The whole, whole skin fell off because I was tracked on the gravel road because I was staying in Makaya. So the guy dragged me on the gravel road and then that left my left side peeled off. Okay. And and what what happened? Did you how did you recover from, from that? Emotionally I didn't recover, but physically I managed to recover because there's some home remedies that we use as black people. So I was told to use a newspaper, you burn a newspaper, you put it away, the, the, the whole skin fell off. Then the newspaper made my skin to recover slowly but surely, however it was dark. So I started using some products to remove the darkness after the skin grew back. Okay, but how did it affect you, especially at school? Because I think, I mean, you obviously. Hence I'm saying emotionally, it, I didn't recover because I couldn't face people. Exactly. And I'm a very energetic person. Self-confidence I got on the high level. But it took that away from me because I was thinking, what are they saying about me? So the only thing I was doing, it was going to the class, getting out and going home. I couldn't even liaise with my, my, my peers or even play with them. So it really dented my self-esteem. But it was there a time where you actually came, bounced back from that experience, or maybe you learned some a powerful lesson out of the, the incident? I only bounced back, honestly, when I went to university, because that's when the outside skin healed. So I started recovering the self-confidence. But during my school years, my, my high school, no, I didn't recover. But, but what can you advise someone, a, a teenager maybe, who might have experienced what you, are, you have experienced actually? What, what can you, like about that, because when I, you, you, you took long for you to, to recover, which I, I, I believe is not actually a good thing for that long, you understand? So what can actually maybe you advise a, a teenager maybe who is facing similar situation that you faced? The minute you realize as a person that it is not my fault and it doesn't even define who I am as a person because we're thinking our outside appearance is what defines us as people. Yes. But once you learn that I am who I am without the outside appearance, then that will help you to heal or that will help you to even be more confident because you'll know that the giant or the inner person in you is better than what you see on the mirror. Mm, powerful. Now, your, your life took a turn when you were diagnosed with TB. Yes. <laughs> Just share with us about that. Well, um, it was 2006 and I started working 
I was working in some call center. It was my first time job after varsity. Then, six months down the line, when I'm enjoying life and all that, I started getting sick. But I thought maybe it's the air conditioner from uh, my workplace. Then I went to the doctor. They kept on saying, no, it's pneumonia. No, it's this. No, it's this. Because they didn't know what it is. All right? But I kept on going worse and worse and worse. I couldn't recover to a point whereby I stopped going to work. I started staying home. Then my mom went to my doctor because it's a family doctor. My mom said to him, you know what? My child has been coming to you, but we don't see any difference. Can you please kindly write us a letter? Then I take her to the clinic because you just don't go to the clinic. All right. The doctor, okay, wrote me a letter to go first to do the x-ray. When I came back from the x-ray, it showed that I've got some something on my lungs. But we couldn't know what it was. Then I was taken to the clinic. That's where they took sputum tests. Then they discovered, okay, I've got TB. But they thought I've got a normal TB. They gave me medication for the normal TB. I took it for six months, but I got more and more worse because it was not the right medication. I was resistant to it to a point where by that medication made my life, my left lung to collapse because it was the wrong medication. So my health status went down and down and down to a point whereby when I was coughing, I was coughing pieces of meat. So... And I was sweating the whole night. My, my blankets would just, if you squeeze them, they will come water. But it was sweat. That's how sweating I was. So up until my mom decided, okay, fine, it's been more than six months. She's taking TB medication, but she's not getting any better. Then she went to the clinic to say, you know what, can you guys give us a letter to go to the hospital? Then at the hospital, that's when they discovered, no, it's not your normal TB, it's what we call MDR, multiple drug resistant, all right, to that certain medication or TB. So I was taken to a, an MDR a hospital. And, and you stood for about eight months? in, in a, Eight in months of my life in an, it's, how can I call it? It's a place whereby not everybody goes there. So it's excluded, if I can say. So not everybody gets to that place. So when you are there, you don't go home. You don't visit. Or when you get visitors, they cannot just enter without the putting on the mask and the protective clothes because apparently it's very contagious and it's deadly. I stayed there eight months of my life. When I got to that hospital, I was this thin. I was like written off. Everybody was saying, ah, she's dying. There's nothing we can do. All right, I got to that hospital. I was given 100 tablets a day. I was taking that's, 60 in the morning that's abnormal. and 40 at night. And you, you get used to... You get used to it. There's nothing you can do. And the next thing they come and say, no, this one is not working. Let's change. And re we were the experiment. they experimenting with us. Because when I got the MDR, MDRTB, it was not popular. So they were still trying to see, okay, let's try this one. No, this one is not working. It's making her more worse. Let's try this one. So, MJ, I was part of the experiment. Now, take, take us through the experience. Okay, it was, you were still on your medication when you fell pregnant. Yes. Right? And the doctor said, no, they advised you actually to abort the child. Yes. And you refused. Yes. <laughs> Why did you refuse? Because they were saying, actually, your condition will not allow you to actually give birth to a child? I only refused because of my belief in my God, my higher power, which is my maker. Because 
I cannot believe what the other person is saying, but I will believe his promises. So they said, and medically, they were right. Yeah. Because I was taking this medication, I had to take it for two years. It's drugs. Mm. So the possibility of my child not making it was very high. Yeah. And another thing, even if he, he was going to make it, they said he's not going to be mentally fit. Yeah. So I was given an advice to say, you know what? Yes, you are pregnant, you want this child. However, you must know one, two, three has the high possibility of happening. And then I was given a choice because it cannot be an obligation. So I said, you know what? I'm not even going to go home and think about it. I am not aborting this child. And, and during birth, the child was declared dead. <laughs> <laughs> a miracle baby. <laughs> That's a miracle. And, and when, when he was being escorted out, that's where he cried and he realized that actually he is alive. Yes. Were you praying that time? What, what happened actually? What happened is that I just went to hospital for a normal checkup. All right. Because I was around seven months. So you go regularly every two weeks. So I went to my gynecologist. When I got there, he was, she was like, no, 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 no. You need to be admitted. The baby does, uh, is not inside the water anymore. The baby, that water, the liquid, is no more. What happened? Did you see, did you feel anything? I was like, no, I didn't see anything. So I got admitted. So I, I was admitted, it was Thursday. And then I was supposed to be operated on Monday. But Saturday morning, before the night shift, left the, the nurses for the night shift so they come and do the last checkup so that they give the report to the the, the shift here in the morning yeah. now there was a machine on my stomach that machine was mo um, monitoring the heartbeat of the baby and the, uh, the nurse got there was like there's no heartbeat and then she ran out called other nurses to come and say guys Come and show me what's happening here. Then they were like, no, there's no heartbeat. The baby's dead. But we need to save her because she's weak also. And then they called my gynecologist. Unfortunately, she was not around. She went to Limpopo. So they called emergency surgeons. Then before I went out of the ward, I asked to make only one call. Because I've got a sister who's a very firm believer in God. Yeah. All right, I called my sister and she said, please do not drop your, call, your phone, I'll pray for you. And then she kept on praying and then they were busy running with that bed. You know, it's an emergency. They run into the emergency room. Then when we got there, okay, fine, they dropped the phone because it's not allowed in there. But I was not dead because I, I could feel everything here, but down there, they gave me a epidural just to kill me the, then that's what happened hmm. and you now you are actually you are bold to say god really answers prayers definitely as you you named your child warabili just like my name you know yes. <laughs> it means god have, have answered hmm. you know so you are really really a firm believer in in god no i am a firm believer in god because all these things that i went through had it not been by him, I don't think I would survive. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I would survive at all. And, and also, you know, it was like, you know, trouble comes after trouble. Not long ago, I mean, three years ago, you actually faced um, an emotional abuse in your relationship. Yes. Do, do you want to share a little bit? Yeah, I can share a little bit. Um, I was in a relationship with this guy. The relationship was fine. You know, when you get to a relationship at that honeymoon phase, everything is fine. But the guy started abusing me emotionally because he would tell me how stupid I am. No one will want me. If I leave him, no man will want me. And keeps on, you know, doing cheating a lot. And would be like yeah even if you want to leave there's no way you can go 
you're not worth it. He kept on making me see that I'm not worth it. I'm useless because, yes, he, he used to say you are very useless. And you were an IT specialist by that time? Yes. So, but how did it affect you when someone tells you that you are useless, whereas you are, have this profession, you earn good money? How did it affect you? Look, when it comes to emotional abuse or emotions, you forget about what you have or who you are. Because the mind is programmed, you listen to what the next person is saying, and you start seeing that reflection in you. You start saying, yeah, but he's right. So it, it didn't matter what I was doing. Even if, after moving from my IT and went to be a retentions consultant, and I was working with so many clients, and they, they would compliment me, I didn't see that. Because at the back of my mind, it was like, you're useless. You're not beautiful. You're not worth it. So it kept on and belt and belt and belt. And at the end of the day, it gave me a, a it, 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 I started getting depression. And you went in and out hospital? Yes, in and out of hospital. I've slept at a hospital called Vista. It's a psychiatrist hospital. And I stayed there for two weeks. And then I came back. Okay, we started mending the relationship. Because, you know, when you are abused, you're thinking, for, okay, fine, even if I can leave, I'm still going to find the very same person. Let me just rather make this work. Yeah. They say it's better for the devil that you know. That you know yeah. than the one that you don't know. <laughs> exactly. So I kept on going back and going back and going back. So when did you decide that, no, this thing is not working? When did you decide that? And you decide to leave? I didn't decide to leave, honestly. What happened is that, okay, the person lost his job and I took him in in my house. We stayed in. And, and when, even if he, when he was abusing me, I was taking care of him financially. Mm -hmm. That's why I ended up being in debt of close to a million rent. Yeah, yeah. So when he got his money from his workplace, he decided to leave. And he didn't leave nicely, like it was chaotic. But Laura, now what, what is the message that actually now, since you have learned so much, you have experienced so much, especially to, to women, what is the message that you have now that you inspire women, especially who are in who are in abusive relationship? What I can say is that put your fits, your, yourself first. Value yourself enough to know that it's time to go. You don't have to stay in an abusive relationship. You don't have to do what you don't want to do. Make yourself a priority. Value yourself. Hmm. No, that, that, that's true. And, and this led you to actually, as you have said, you know, you got into debt for about a million rent. And, and actually you lost your cars, you lost your house. Yes. And you end up having nothing, you know. Uh, but I want to know, where was your family, where were your friends when this thing was happening? Did you consult any of them for help? Let me tell you something. When you're going through the adversities of life or facing problems, you don't have a friend. When days are dark. When days are dark, friends are few. Friends only want you when they can only benefit. My family, I'm this person, I'm, a, I'm this strong person. So to me, I don't want to show them that, you know what, I'm going through hell. All right? I'll tell them like synopsis of what's happening, but they didn't know the real thing. I couldn't even pick up a phone to say, you know what, my kids don't have bread because I lost my job because of depression. After losing my job, now I lost everything because now I can't pay for anything. I can't pay for the place that I'm staying in. I can't pay for the car. So everything just went bush. To a point by, I remember one day when my son went to school and he came back, there was nothing. I think that is the point whereby I felt, you know what, enough is enough. I'd rather die than see my kids suffer. Because 
I couldn't even buy bread for them to go to school. That's where the thought of suicide actually started. <laughs> yes, but this one specific day when he came back from school, and there was not even maize meal for me to make mtoho. The only thing that was in the house was sugar. I only made, we call it skambelele from where I come from. It's like your sugar water, you put water, sugar inside water because it at least gives you yeah, energy, strength, yes. that strength. Yeah. That's, that was the breaking point. To see my child not having anything to eat and coming back from school. So that means that there won't be anything to eat at night. So he's still going to sleep without food. Yeah. So that was the breaking point and I decided, you know what, at least I've got a two million rent life cover that my sister was paying for me to say, you know what, yes, I understand you can't pay your life covers, you can pay your funeral covers, but let me take care of this one because we don't know what's going to happen in life. At least let me pay for, for you. And then she paid for me that life cover and then I thought, okay, fine, because I worked in insurance companies, I know how... The, the the whole thing works. If you are on the life cover for more than two years, if you commit suicide, they're still gonna pay. You pay out, you claim. So I was thinking, okay, fine. My kids rather have the two million rent to take care of them. Yes, it's not enough money, but they're not gonna suffer. And like me being in their life and being useless. All right, so you, you say you believed that, you know, the two million will take care of, 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 your, of your children. But I want to know what actually stopped you not committing suicide. Because, you know, nowadays we are having a problem of many South Africans committing suicide. I mean, just not long ago we have lost one of the greatest musicians in, in our country. We have committed suicide and he attempted three times before he committed the last one. And, and he failed in, in those three, three, three times. So, when, what actually made you to be with me here today? I wrote a suicide note. I wrote it on Facebook. It was saying, I did all I could, but I failed. Enough is enough. All right? And Puselezo, there's a lady called Puselezo, is a transformation coach. I didn't know her by, the, by that time, but I was following her, and then I, she would follow my stories. Then she inboxed me. I didn't um, respond. I don't know where she got my number. She called me because by that time I took the whole packet of sleeping pills. And she's the one who actually advised you not to go through yes. what you want to go through. Us, Laura, what is the message, the last message maybe that you can actually say to the women who are experiencing emotional abuse, just like you, you did? What, what can you say to them? you know, for them to be strong, just like you today, look at you today, you're a life coach, you know, mm -hmm. you share your story to inspire the generation, you share your story to change someone's life, you know, but there is someone who is watching us right now as we speak, and is facing the same problem that you are facing, that you were facing, what can you say to that person? I would say, get out, when, whilst there's still time, realize that you're worth more than what you're getting and do not allow yourself to even get to a depressed mode or a depressed state because it's not easy to get out of that state mm -hmm. and another thing is that it's because a depression it's like a chronic disease you don't get healed from depression but you can only manage it you can only live better but you cannot get out of it it's not, uh, you cannot heal it. So do not even allow yourself to get into that. Once you see the signs, just live. You're better off without that person. Yeah, that's inspiring. Where can people find you if they want to listen or to hear more about your story? Or maybe get in contact with your life coaching sessions? Where can they find you? Okay, I've got a Facebook, Facebook page. It's Laura M, Laura Makafola. And then I've got a Facebook page called House of Laura M. This the, the, the brand that I'm using as a life coach. And then 
they can also find me on www.houseoflauram.co.za which is my website and also they can reach me on 062-751-5835 thank you very much Ms. Laura for coming to the show you are really an inspiration um, and I believe that you know I I will have to invite you again especially we did not touch the issue of your app your dating app <laughs> <laughs> i wanted to ask you more about that one but but um we will give it time you know to come for you to to explain more about it so thank you very much for coming it was a really motivational session uh, encouragement and inspiration continue so doing much. the good work that you're doing thank you so much for inviting me and yeah I really appreciate this platform because I know it will change someone else's life. Exactly. exactly. That is the motive. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you are watching Inspired Conversations, Living the Legacy with the Legends. Thank you very much for joining us. And I believe we will meet again next week, same time, same place, on Global Conference TV. My name is Unkarabile Wisdom Mokoto, award winning author, speaker, and coach. And I'm saying to you, life. The journey continues.